Hey folks, and welcome back to the least knowledgeable sim racing channel. Today, we're tackling a topic which has been a fascination of mine ever since I got into sim racing. iRacing is currently the front runner of PC sim racing, if we're taking into account concurrent play accounts and community size. Even the venerable Assetto Corsa can't match the active play accounts, especially not in multiplayer. So what made iRacing, a game based upon a very aged engine, so ubiquitous in sim racing? Well, the keyword lies right in there, community. iRacing offers the best curated online platform to get you racing against other players of a similar skill level consistently. This is a double benefit because this strong sense of community creates both an echo chamber and a secondary marketing team for the sim. We're going to explore how the team at iRacing use marketing psychology pioneered by the likes of Apple on a grander scale to create a user base that not only accepted prices that were significantly higher than comparable sims, but also continually self-justified as to why they were necessary. As a company director and business owner, the iRacing approach has always fascinated me on an academic level, and now that we have a platform here on YouTube, well, what better time to explore it? We'll go over an assortment of lead-in topics such as the nature and types of monetization in modern video games, the psychological techniques that marketing teams use to bring customers on side, the maintenance required in order to ensure continued loyalty, and how all of this relates to sim racing as a whole in the modern era. The gift that keeps giving. This is how Take-Two Interactive characterized GTA 5's online mode back in 2014. Whereas in the past, the publisher would have had to have shipped a product in order to get a one-shot payment from customers, they had now discovered a persistent online platform they could keep developing and adding to in order to continually financially strain their user base. Of course, by 2014, this was nothing new. By the late 90s, we'd already seen the emergence of massively multiplayer online RPGs. Titles such as Ultima Online, Anarchy Online, and the immensely popular World of Warcraft had already pioneered the concept of games as a service rather than a product. These games came in a few different flavors, from the pay-to-play model, which usually required a one-shot payment for the base game, including an ongoing subscription cost, to the now popular free-to-play model, which grants players access to the base game for nothing, but relies on microtransactions for vanity, advancement, and character customization. While there are more forms of monetization in the middle, these two broadly cover what was pioneered in the time. As time wore on, even the traditional buy-to-play games, which usually just required a single payment to get access to the entire game, increasingly became littered with microtransactions. Many claim that this was truly entrenched with EA's Ultimate Team, which used the trading card monetization strategy to ensure players would keep paying long after they had bought the vanilla game. This later became normalized in the form of loot chests in titles such as Overwatch, Borderlands 2, and COD. After the massive backlash to the loot boxes in Star Wars Battlefront 2, the industry started to back off this monetization model somewhat. At least on the main consoles and the PC, the mobile market continued to rake in hundreds of millions using these techniques. So why the diatribe on monetization over the last two decades? Well, because this relates to iRacing in a very unique way. Most sim racing titles adopted the classic buy-to-play model. That is, you make a one-shot payment and get access to a wide swath of content which comes with the vanilla game that's subsequently expanded through the release of individual DLCs. Fairly commonplace strategy for smaller, more niche studios to stay profitable while selling to smaller, more concentrated fan bases. iRacing is unique in that it opted for a subscription model. That is, a monthly fee of 13 United States dollars to get access to its vanilla content of 16 cars and 22 tracks. Seems like a pretty reasonable deal on its surface, right? It is, until you realize that every additional car that you purchase has an additional one-shot fee of $11.95, and every track has an additional fee of $11.95 or $14.95. In this sense, iRacing is unique in sim racing, because not only does it charge a monthly subscription, it also charges a one-shot DLC fee for further access to content. Whereas the popular model of free-to-play gets players into the game at no cost and then monetizes by using microtransactions, iRacing double dips by charging a subscription and charging for DLC. This was something pioneered by World of Warcraft many years ago with the addition of premium steeds. Up until that point, games had only been monetized one way. 
It was either a subscription which granted you access to everything, a one-shot fee which granted you access to everything, or a free-to-play model which cost you nothing but then monetized with microtransactions. It was here where they began to legitimize the strategy of double dipping, which has become so ubiquitous in modern gaming. As with all titles where the entire pool of content potentially runs to the thousands of dollars, iRacing offers tiered discounts. Purchase any three or more cars at the same time and receive 10% off. Purchase any six and get 15% off, etc, etc, you get the idea. This is necessary in establishing a value proposition to the customer. As of March 2020, Overtake GG calculated that access to every single car and track in the game would run you to a total bill of $1,548.86. This is with the tier discount bundles applied. This also doesn't take into account ongoing membership costs, which at their very best would cost you $199 USD for every two years. Had you signed up on release back in 2008, the membership fees alone would have set you back 2,587 USD. This is with all publicly listed discount opportunities applied for the best case scenario. As a result, you can see how more than a few longtime iRacing members could be at least a few thousand dollars down the well with their lifetime iRacing expenditure. This is exponentially more than they will be asked to pay for for all of the content included in many comparable sims. Herein lies the crucial component. When a player's subscription runs out, they lose access to all content. This is critical to the vast success of iRacing's business strategy, because it's predicated upon the sunk cost fallacy. Throughout the 90s and 2000s, in my domestic industry of audio production, there was a company called Digidesign which sold a production audio workstation called Pro Tools. Much as iRacing and sim racing, Pro Tools had become the de facto standard for anybody wanting to run a truly professional facility in audio production. This, however, came with a rather large catch. Pro Tools was software, but software that was hardware locked. That is, you had to buy into increasingly more expensive tiers of hardware in order to unlock software features. Their professional solution, Pro Tools HD, ranged in cost anywhere from 10,000 to 30,000 Australian dollars. Now, this presents a bit of a problem when the nearest competitors sold their software from a few hundred to several hundred dollars at the very most. So, how does a company in DigiDesign's position maintain the perceived value proposition in their products when they cost thousands of percent more than their nearest competition? The first is via cult of personality. The company, if they're lucky or tactful enough to establish a monopoly, can cultivate the image that their products are the only way to be taken seriously by one's peers. Digidesign, with their community leading the charge, fed this conception without reservation. The second way is by purporting that their platform offers something which none other does. In their case, it was the off-board DSP processing chips included with their HD hardware, which would unload the native CPU and allow for processing very large sessions. So, how did Digidesign get their users to not only pay exponentially more for their software than they needed to, but also propagate the view that everybody else had to do the same? Through the power of sunk cost fallacy. As defined by behavioraleconomics.com, individuals commit the sunk cost fallacy when they continue a behavior or endeavor as a result of previously invested resources, time, money, or effort. This fallacy, which is related to loss aversion and status quo bias, can also be viewed as bias resulting from an ongoing commitment. It doesn't take a long bow to draw a direct comparison between how Digidesign uses a psychological hack to overcome an absurd market position and how iRacing continue to do the same. The brain is an elaborate emotional balancing machine. Every decision you ever make is made well in advance of you being aware of it. All the effort expended afterward is first in justifying that decision to yourself and then to others. This is why sunk cost is so powerful. It's an immensely difficult proposition for one to swallow that they've invested thousands in a pursuit which could have been equated for with a fraction of that same outlay. This is where we begin to hear the popular rationalizations of nothing else can give you the same experience, or it has to cost this much in order to continue generating such a high quality product, etc, etc. It's quite commonplace between industries. 
In fact, the popular myth that iRacing cultivated over the years was that it was the only true choice for real motorsports professionals and people who took sim racing seriously. This of course got strenuously evaluated during the 2020 lockdowns where a slew of real life racing professionals moved over to iRacing and put the marketing claims to the test. This resulted in opinions such as the following being voiced in a not so quiet manner. These cars are harder to drive, I hate to say that, than our cars. Our cars are pretty forgiving. When you get loose, they kind of catch themselves a little bit. This thing, when it gets loose, she gone. Like, what the heck is going on? This co It feels like I'm driving on a wet track. Like, honestly, like, I, there never once in real life have I ever had rotation that early into a hairpin at Barber. Like, are you kidding me? The, the good thing about real life is... Thing. You can control the race car a lot better than on this sim. Yeah, the, the cars are too slippy in, in, in iRacing. The rear is just disconnected from the front. Oh, oh my god! What the hell? What the fuck? Bro, what the hell happened then? What the fuck? Dude, seriously, this game uh, is ridiculous. Did you see that? So, speaking with someone at IndyCar today and was told that, uh, the next time a driver wants to say something critical of iRacing or say that it it isn't feeling exactly like an indie car, uh, please let us know first. Uh, because apparently some folks there didn't like Scott Dixon's comments about, hey, it's not real and uh, I'm not really being able to jive with it. iRacing tires! Get the fucking job done! iRacing! What the fuck is going on, iRacing? Fix it! Oh my God. Fix your fucking tires! Now, it's fair to say that similar critiques were levied against R Factor 2 during this time by professional drivers, so this was revelatory of the entire sim racing scene rather than just a particular title. However, it does go to show how far marketing and public sentiment can go if there are no checks and balances made against it. The common catchphrase in the iRacing community is that it has to cost this much in order to reinvest back into the game and make it its best. Now here was reality charging in, starkly at odds with the marketing catchphrase. This left iRacing in an interesting position. The outlier voices which had been marginalized by the greater community for years, saying that the handling model needed work, were now being supported by professional race car drivers. The inconvenient truths could no longer just be swept away in order to maintain the image crafted by marketing, and there had to be a reconciliation. As a result, for the first time in perhaps a long time, the notion of we have to pay this much in order to continue supporting the development of the sim actually became true. We started to see rapid updates to the tire models and to the damage models in order to make close contact high impact racing more realistic. Due to the negative press that sim racing was seeing, it was finally spurred to divesting some of those funds into actually improving the simulated experience. One of the things not at all alien to any sim racing content creators is the experience of being abused in a vitriolic fashion by somebody who's taken personally remarks made in constructive criticism of a particular sim. In fact, that's practically ubiquitous with our industry. It's no surprise, however, as people by their very nature tend to congregate in like-minded groups for security and validation. This establishes what's known as group identity and leads to the loss of individual tendencies for those involved in that shared identity. This happens a lot on online forums and groups and tends to breed much of what's considered as the in-group toxicity of sim racing. A savvy sim racing developer is wise to both weaponize and use this adherent loyalty to their advantage. It can come in the form that their sim is the benchmark for realism and therefore beyond all reproach or that real-life drivers X, Y, and Z all main the sim and therefore it's the next best thing to real life. What this does is militarize the most ardent members of a community and create a sort of inquisition where they go out into the wider industry and espouse the sort of echo chamber rhetoric which blooms in these communities. This is why sim racing is often littered with so many contradictory claims. Each group develops its own truth, led by its group identity. And instead of coming together to test which methodologies are empirically the best, we just get infighting and ideological warfare. The exploitation of group identity was executed wonderfully by the tech giant Apple in the mid-2000s with their series of lifestyle ads against Windows, establishing their brand as a sort of culture. 
The idea is that not only were their products easier to use, but they also made the user more culturally hip. The success of this campaign led to an explosion of Apple market share, led first by the iPod, which then developed to the iPhone becoming synonymous with modern society. Much as Apple did, iRacing uses group identity to its own advantage. It's well established in business psychology that the more a consumer pays for a product, the more they inherently value it. iRacing uses its pricing model to create a sort of prestige around the product, which acts as a springboard for everything else. The big emphasis on community and multiplay means that a large number of people are going to naturally congregate and create an in-group. That in-group will subsequently create an echo chamber of beliefs and automatically ostracize anybody that doesn't conform to their ideological ideal, much as human tribes have done for countless millennia. The great thing here is that it becomes self-sustaining. It develops its own momentum. Marketing only has to feed in a phrase here or there, the community run with it and turn it into a reality for themselves. It's truly an idyllic position to occupy as a business. Not only does it inherently create a form of monopoly and prestige, but it ensures that consumers will continue to self-justify any costs you throw their way. It's now 2021. Sim racing has come a long way since iRacing first launched in 2008. Titles like Assetto Corsa Competizione are emerging as the preferred sim for various real-life drivers and managing to do so while maintaining the classic buy-to-play model which doesn't require a subscription nor potentially lock the player out of any content they've paid for. Third-party platforms such as the SimGrid and SimRacing.gp are coming along to add curated online functionality to titles such as ACC, while other titles such as R Factor 2 are creating their own competition systems in order to compete. On the other hand, no other sim currently handles oval racing at the level of iRacing. Moreover, no other sim has the level of online integration and policing that iRacing has. There are also other niche racing disciplines which are almost entirely the purview of iRacing. Audiovisually, iRacing is not a contender in the modern era, and the force feedback engine, running at an antiquated 60 hertz, is considered one of the least desirable in all of sim racing. To get back to my professional audio analogy, Eventually, Digidesign, with their Pro Tools software, had to give in to the tide of convenience being offered by increasing native computing power. That is, their $30,000 HD3 systems were ultimately being outperformed by native CPUs in the end. In fact, as I record this on my 16-core Ryzen CPU, it seems laughable that we're ever pushed into paying that much for off-board DSP. Digidesign eventually had to break their hardware lock on their software and begin competing on an even playing field with their rivals. Operating as Avid now, they still prefer to license their software via a subscription model, ensuring repeated buy-ins and a continual financial straining of their user base. To that end, as a businessman, I wonder how long iRacing can keep it going for. When you have simulations such as ACC coming along which look better, sound better, and by the opinions of many, even drive better, coming in with dedicated online platforms with ratings which an increasing number of the community are beginning to adopt. If you are an iRacing driver and you get lots of joy out of the platform, then more power to you. One of the great things about sim racing at present is that there's just about a sim for everybody. This video is here to neither praise nor cast shade on iRacing's monetization strategy, but merely to showcase the psychology behind it. As a business owner, I can't help but respect the totality of it. It's the idyllic position to occupy in an industry because the product's prestige self-propagates. What I'm really curious about is how long they can maintain that value proposition for their customers with the increasing level of competition around them. I suppose only time will tell. Thank you for joining me in this self-indulgent dissertation on business psychology. If you enjoy content like this, as well as the occasional sim racing, make sure to hit that little red button to stay up to date with future videos. If not, just hit that dislike button twice for me and show me who's boss. Until next time, we'll see you later.